Welcome to the Haskell Ring, the series where we solve programming problems, but, you know, in Haskell. All right, the next problem is sock merchant. John works at a clothing store. He has a large pile of socks that must be paired by color for sale, given an array of integers representing the color of each sock. Determine how many pairs of socks with matching colors there are. For example, there are seven socks with colors. There's one pair of color one and one of color two. There are three odd socks left, one of each color. The number of pairs is two. This is actually a pretty straightforward functional problem, so let's just go ahead and solve it. Obviously, this is a function from a bunch of integers to another integer. I think the easiest way would be to group each sock by their color and see how many pairs we can form from each color. So basically, we're gonna group the socks by color. We already used group function a couple of times. It's a pretty useful function. I like to use it a lot. And then we iterate through each group and divide its length by two. And that gives us the amount of pairs we can form from this group. And then we just sum all of the pairs. That's it that should be the solution of, of this problem. Let's actually check how it works. Okay, so we don't have group and sort. That means we have to import data and list. So now let's grab the data and see if we can solve that particular data. The answer is three. And what's the official answer? It's also three. So as usual, let's just wrap it into an interactive problem and submit it. So it's actually pretty uh, simple and straightforward problem. We're not gonna focus on it too, too much. So first we separate everything by words and we get rid of the n, we don't need it in Haskell. Then we convert everything to integers and we just solve it. Since the result of the solution is integer, we have to convert it back to a string. And this is our final solution. Let's just go ahead and try to submit uh, that issue. Let's see if it compiles on their site. It does and let's submit that. All right. Next problem. The next problem is going to be really interesting. The next problem is day of the programmer. This particular problem tol talks about Russia, my favorite country of all time. Russia is very special. From 1700 to 1917, Russia's official calendar was the Julian calendar. But since 1919, they used the Gregorian calendar. The transition from the Julian to Gregorian calendar system occurred in 1918, when the next day after January 31st was the February 14th. This means that in 1980, February 14th was the 32nd day of the year in Russia. And we have to answer a simple question. Given a year, we have to print a date of the day of the programmer in Russia. So if you don't know what is a day of the programmer, it's basically the 256th day of the year. And since we have leap years and the calendar transition is kind of a tricky problem to figure out. So yeah, we're going to try to solve it. It's rather interesting. In most of the cases, the answer to the problem is going to be either 1209 year or 1309 year. In most of the cases, except the year of the transition. The year of the transition is going to be a special case that we'll have to treat separately. And another interesting thing, the only difference for us between Julian and Gregorian calendar is the way how they determine the leap year. So yeah, since uh, we're going to have identical answers, I really want to have a, a functions that will help me to construct the answer. For example, I want to have a function leap day from a year to a string and norm day from a year to a string. On a leap year, the answer is going to be 1209 plus show year because year, as you can see, is integer. So we convert it to a string and concatenate it with this prefix. On a normal day, on a normal year, it's going to be 1309 plus show year. Honestly, I use string concatenation a lot in Haskell rank series, but when I program real world application in Haskell, I don't really like it because uh, when it becomes too long, it just becomes a huge mess to handle. So what I prefer instead, I prefer to format uh, my strings. So for that, in Haskell, we have a module text printf. So let's take a look at this particular function. Printf, it's, it has a really strange uh, signature. It takes a string and returns something r, which is a printf type. Let's take a look closer at this particular type class. So there are several printf types. So basically this is the, the types that printf can return you. One of the types is a list of characters. Another one is IO. So basically that means that if you want, printf can perform side effects. 
effects, but we don't really need any side effects. So for example, if I do something like hello percent d and by the way printf actually supports the c printf format which is nice if you have like experience with uh, with c you can simply apply that experience and it's gonna work this is going to print that particular thing but this is because the shell jhci shell of haskell expects this expression to have io type so that's why printf performed a side effect but if you say that you want printf to return a string it will actually return a string and not perform a side effect and this is the thing that we are going to use we are going to use printf percent d and just year let's recompile that and see leap day 2018 uh, norm day 2018 and it works and what's interesting we have an opportunity to apply at a reduction to it i already mentioned at a reduction in one of my previous episodes but i didn't explain what it is if you're familiar with javascript i think the easiest way to explain that would be like so for example you have a function uh, like an anonymous function and you invoke it and then inside of that function you invoke another function i think you also have to put parentheses here so just look at this expression and tell me if it does make sense to you i think it's absolutely useless expression because it's absolutely equivalent to just calling f and that's what we call eta reduction because sometimes you end up with extra functions wrapped around another functions and they're just not needed so in this case we have a function print f wrapped in leap day function so that means we can easily just remove the year and will still work so this is how at reduction is done. Since we have answer templates, let's go ahead and try to solve this problem if Russia used only Julian calendar. The difficulty for this task comes from transition from one calendar to another, but we're gonna remove complexity for now and boil down to just one calendar. So let's create a function called Julian, which takes a year and returns an answer. First thing we have to do, we have to determine whether the year is the leap year or not. In Julian calendar, the leap year is the year that is divisible by four. So that means we have to use leap day template, like so. Otherwise, it's a normal day. So let's see if it works. The year 2018, the next one, next one. Okay, so the, on the leap year 2020, the day of the program is gonna be this. Okay, so f we solved that for Julian calendar. Let's try to solve that for Gregorian calendar. It's gonna be absolutely the same, but the way we determine uh, the leap year is gonna be slightly different. So in Gregorian calendar, the leap year is the year that is divisible by 400, or the year that is divisible by four and not divisible by 100. Oh, by the way, not equal in Husky is actually slash equal. So this is another leap year in Gregorian calendar. Otherwise, it's a normal day. All right, so let's just check how it works. We go in, it works. Seems to work, seems to work. Everything seems to work. We have two solutions for Julian calendar and for Gregorian calendar. But Russia is special. Russia is basically a combination of Julian and Gregorian calendar. So let's actually create another function that basically uses these two functions to answer on the question. For Russia, we're gonna have two special cases. When the year is less than 9070, uh, less or equal 9070, we use Julian calendar. Otherwise, we have to use Gregorian calendar. And that's pretty much the solution. That doesn't compile because I forgot the year variable. But this is not gonna work for year 9018 because on the year 9018, a special thing happened. After the January 31st was February 14th. So specifically for that year, for the year 1918, we, we have to have a special case. But the question is, what is that special case? Let's actually write down all of the months January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. And for each month, let's actually write down the amount of days in that month. 31, 29, 31, 30, 31, 30, 31. On August, it's also 31. This is like an exception. On September 30, October 31, November 30, December 31. On 1918, Russia had one month in Julian calendar. And after January 31st, suddenly February 14th happened. So what that means? That means that particular year lost 13 days. So to compensate 
these 13 days, we're going to simply add them to the day of programmer. So this is the special case for that year. All right, this is just a functional solution. Let's wrap it into an interactive program. The input of the program is actually string. So we have to convert it to an integer and pipe it through the Russian solution. Russian solution returns a string. So that means we don't have to convert anything and we can use this as the final solution. Let's just go ahead and do that. Um, run the code. It passes the sample tests and let's submit that. All right. As you can see, it works. Next problem. <laughs>